My name's Mike, uh, Mike Williams. Uh, I'm going to talk about summarizing um, documents. And uh, thank you very much for coming. I know there's a lot of other options in Midtown today. I know Donald Trump was announcing his vice presidency. Um, and I'm glad you're here instead for many reasons. Um, summarization, as I hope I'll show, and probably you already have some intuition for, is an intrinsically useful thing to do. We've all made these dreadful word cloud things. And I'm going to try and show you a richer, more semantically meaningful alternative. And in fact, I'm going to try and show you three alternatives. But there's more to this talk than just summarization. Step one of summarization is step one of almost any task involving natural language processing. And that's the step where we take words, human words, and get them into the computer. And in, in, the way we do that is we vectorize it. We turn it into numbers, because computers speak only numbers. And we need to do as good a job as possible as the, at that in order to do a good job at summarization. But doing a good job at that task for summarization is also a powerful first step for other downstream natural language processing tasks. So hopefully you'll see some work here that's sort of fundamental to natural language processing. It's mostly not my work. I work at a company called Fast Forward Labs, and what we do is applied research, which means we steal ideas from academia, basically, and turn them into reports like this. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of ideas that are new out or newish out of academia, one very new, one around 10 years old, that allow us to do a particularly good job at summarization. Summarization was our most recent report, and there it is up there. For these reports, we don't just write books, though. We build working prototypes that demonstrate the algorithm to our clients. And we build those prototypes, and this is the reason I'm here today, we build those prototypes in Python. We find Python a very expressive language. It's very commonly in use in the academic community, who we work with a lot. Um, and it's in many ways a lingua franca for our clients. So although some of them work in JVM languages, or some of them even work in R, um, they find that, or we find that Python is a mutually shared language that we can all, all speak. So I'm going to show some, so, show some Python code here, but really this talk is a conceptual talk about the algorithms. I'm going to provide a link dump at the end of further reading if you want to dig into the technical details of what I've talked about. But like I said, I'm going to focus on the algorithmic side of things. But first, let's define the problem. This cartoon is extractive summarization. You've got a long document on the left, and what we want to do is generate a shorter document, a document that represents the salient ideas in the longer document. That shorter document is the summary. Um, and summarization, of course, is an incredibly important task. But now more than ever, I think, as we generate more and more documents as a, as a civilization, I guess. Um, there's also abstractive summarization, and that's a much harder problem, and we're not going to get into it today. The cartoon here is extractive summarization, where we rip out extracts verbatim, perhaps do some nice work to stitch them together so they flow better. Abstractive summarization is generating new text. So abstractive summarization is what a headline writer does when they headline a newspaper article. They write new text. We're not going to get into that today. But we are going to get into multi-document summarization. Uh, which is pulling extracts from multiple documents in order to come up with a summary that um, represents the salient ideas in a corpus, which is a, a very interesting challenge. So this is one of those Pygotham 55-minute talks. I want to give you sort of a, a rough outline of, of where we're headed and how the talk is going to be structured. I'm going to talk about three ways of solving this problem. One is a stupid, simple idea from 1958 that... I really like because, well, you can write down the algorithm in two or three lines of Python. And not, I'm not going to do that. That's an exercise for you guys if you want to do it. Um, but also, it goes through the same framework as the other two more sophisticated algorithms do. Um, sorry, one thing I should just say is if you have any trouble reading these slides, the link to the slides is up there on the first slide. If you want to pull it up, there's going to be a bit of code if you want to copy and paste it or anything like that. Or if you have any trouble following my preposterous accent, you may find those useful. So we're going to talk about Loon's method, this very simple approach. And then we're going to move on to topic modeling. Topic modeling is an idea that's around 10 years old, and it's going to allow us to do a much better job, but fundamentally following the same framework as we followed when implementing Loon's method. And then we're going to get into the really cutting edge stuff. We're going to talk about an idea called skip thoughts, which is related to something called word to vec which you might have heard of. Uh, and we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks and using those for document summarization. I'm going to compare those three approaches. They obviously have trade-offs. Um, in particular, Loon's method doesn't work very well, which is obviously a rather severe trade-off. Um, but we're going to talk about more su substantial engineering trade-offs as well. And then I'm going to connect 
all of these approaches to language modeling problems, other downstream natural language processing tasks like machine translation, like audio transcription, like caption generation from images. And then, like I say, I'm going to provide a, a link dump. And this talk is conceptual, so I'm going to avoid mathematics. But when I dump those links on you, I'm going to try and explain why I'm doing it and point to which ones are relevant rather than just say, here's a link, or you can Google recurrent neural networks and figure it out for yourself, which isn't very fair. So let's get started. This is Hans-Peter Loon, who uh, he worked at IBM from 1941 he, until his death in 1968, I think. Um, and he's important to our story because in 1958, he wrote this thing, the automatic creation of literature abstracts, which is one of the early papers on document summarization, on knowledge discovery, as it started to be called around then. It's a great paper. I really recommend reading it. It's very, very readable. And if, you have, if you've never implemented just for fun an academic paper, this is a great place to start. It's a very simple algorithm, and you could do it probably in three or four lines of Python, I bet. Um, rather than show you the paper, rather than show you any mathematics, I'm just going to walk through a demo of the algorithm. And you can find that demo if you can read that URL there. It's fastforwardlabs.com slash loon. Uh, and the way you do it, first thing you do is you get some text. Here's our text. This happens to be a, an article I read in the New York Times about people who wake up at 2 a.m. and then go back to bed at 8 a.m., which apparently is a thing people do. Um, the first thing you do with this article is uh, delete the stop words. Stop words are generally short pronouns, conjunction-type words. In English, that means things like he, she, it, and the. And they have relatively little meaning on their own when isolated out of context. And in fact, the first thing we're going to do is isolate all these words out of context. So we're going to start by throwing away all the stop words. And you can find lists of stop words uh, you can't, you, just by Googling those. Um, the next thing we're going to do is for the entire document, count the words that occur the most often. This first word, dovee, apparently is this, the, the word for these people who get up in the middle of the night. Um, and then we've got sleep, segmented, uh, like. Um, these are the top words. And here comes Loon's intuition. Loon's intuition is that any word that occurs often in this document is important to its meaning. So we are going to use these um, uh, frequent important words to score individual sentences. And the way we're going to score them is first arbitrarily say the top four words are important. If you play around this algorithm, you might have fun changing that number. But we're going to say the top four words are important. And we're then going to score each sentence by the number of times it uses one of those words. You can see why this is stupid simple. So we're going to score each sentence. And you're going to see some sentences that mention dovee or sleep or segmented several times. And those get correspondingly high scores. And for this extractive summary, we're just going to pick the top four sentences. The four sentences that most often mention the words that are most important to the document. That's the entirety of Loon's algorithm. It's very, very simple, and it actually doesn't work terribly in jargon-heavy documents. Loon designed it with scientific papers in mind, where jargon is all over the place. Um, but the reason I, uh, it doesn't work very well generally, and if you, take, if you read that full article and then look at the, the summary I showed you, or if you play with the demo, you can dump your own text in it, you'll see it doesn't generally work super well. But the reason I, I show it is because it demonstrates the framework that, as far as I've been able to establish, all summarization schemes follow. They first vectorize the text. They turn it into a number or a series of numbers. Given that vectorized representation, the next thing they do is score each sentence. Each sentence's vectorization is assigned a score, which is calculated in terms of the vectorized representation. And then they select high-scoring sentences. That's the vectorized score select framework. And the algorithms I'm going to show later, the two algorithms that are coming up, are also going to follow that framework. So keep that in mind. Um, in Loon's method, what we're doing is um, we're vectorizing each sentence by turning it into a bag of words representation. We're constructing a vector that's probably something like 30,000 numbers long. That's you know, roughly how many words are in a typical um, group of documents uh, or you know, uh, normal vocabulary. And every element in that vector is going to be zero except the words that occurred in that sentence. So it's a sparse representation. And then we are going to score each, each of those bag of words representations by how many, how many ones are there corresponding to important words. That's the scoring phrase. And then select is it easy. You just take the four top scoring sentences. We could, of course, improve that scoring phase by applying heuristics. You probably all have some intuition that 
the early sentences in a document are more important than the ones in the middle. So we could tune the scores, cheat by adding a few points to the score for the, de the sentences that occur earliest in the document. And we probably see better performance for certain kinds of documents. But those heuristics get fragile very quickly. They may not work for certain kinds of documents. They work very well for uh, news articles written in the United States. They don't work particularly well, actually, for news articles written in the United Kingdom, that particular heuristic. I mean, but you can keep coming up with heuristics. But the problem with that is you, as the engineer, need to understand the document. You need to understand it in order to invent heuristics. You need to understand the language, of course, to invent heuristics. And you need to understand it in order to assess the quality of that heuristic, whether it actually improves the summary. So we're computer scientists. We'd rather not read any text. So we're going to move on from that, um, from those sort of fragile and domain-specific approaches. But there's also a more fundamental problem with, with Loon's algorithm here, which is that the vectorization step only looks for common words, not common topics. So for example, let's say I'd found one of my significant words is the word movie. This is some document about, uh, about movies. That, if I found that, I would not then assign a high score to a sentence containing the word film or a sentence containing the word director. But of course, by this intuition, those are important sentences. So what we're going to try and do next is replace this idea of significant words with a fuzzier, more semantically uh, general idea uh, of topics. Uh, and that's where we met Hans Peter Loon, and this is where we meet this guy. This is David Bly, who works up the street at Columbia. And in 2003, he published with a couple of collaborators a paper called Latent Dirichlet Allocation. I'm not going to get into the, the technical details of what goes on in Latent Dirichlet Allocation, but I've got some references for you later. But I'm going to try and build up some intuition for what's going on. This is topic modeling, if you've heard of topic modeling. So remember in Loon's approach, we looked for sentences that mention words that occur for frequently in the document. Now we're going to look for sentences that mention topics that are important to the document. But of course, what's a topic? How can we identify them automatically? And that's where LDA comes in, latent Dirichlet allocation. LDA is a generative model, which we, we, means we assume documents are generated by an essentially random process. And that's obviously, you know, for most documents, not how they're written. It's not a good assumption. But it turns out to be an empirically very useful assumption that allows us to do useful things. So bear with me as I describe the, frankly, preposterous assumptions involved. So the first thing we do is say each document is a mixture of topics. Each document is, for example, a document might be 50% about politics, 30% about computers, and 20% about genetics. And here's a, here's a cartoon of, of one such document. That's the idea. But what's a topic? A topic is a probability distribution across words. Across, remember our 30,000 30, word vocabulary? It's a probability distribution across that. So the politics topic assigns high probability to words like Obama, or Trump, or Boris Johnson, or whoever. Um, and low probability to cheesecake. Um, so we assume documents are written by someone drawing from these two probability distributions at random. They have a document they want to write. They choose its probability, uh, sorry, its topic distribution. So they might say, indeed, they might say 50% politics, 30% computers, 20% genetics. And then they, toss a, well, they, they draw from that distribution, that 50, 30, 20, to get the topic of the first word in the document. And let's say they choose computers. They then choose from the probability distribution corresponding to that topic. So they choose a word. And they might choose you know, motherboard or data or whatever. So that's the first word in the document. They keep doing that for as long as the document is. And obviously, they end up with total gibberish if they do this. But it does reflect the probability distribution or the topic distribution of the document. Um, and this all sounds very nice, but the problem is, of course, we don't have the, the topics, and we don't know the topic distributions of the documents. So how do we get that? We first need to essentially run the model in reverse. This is a class of problems called posterior inference, which I'm not going to get into. But the idea is, given a big corpus of documents, can we infer what topics exist? Can we infer what the probability distributions over words are? Those are topics that are represented in this corpus of documents. Um, so this is where latent Dirichlet allocation comes in. It's a bit intricate algebraically, but it turns out that since last November, it's in scikit-learn, which is good news for all of us. Um, so that happened in 0 0.17. Two slight complications. One is there's already a um, algorithm in scikit-learn called LDA that is not latent Dirichlet allocation. So if you're reading the docs, don't get caught out 
there. Uh, you don't want scikit-learn LDA, which is going to be renamed in a couple of versions. You want scikit-learn dot decomposition dot latent Dirichlet allocation in the docs or if you're playing with it. The other complication is I did this work before LDA was added to scikit-learn, so I actually used a different uh, LDA package, which works perfectly fine, and you, 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 know, you may well want to use it. Probably the way the wind is blowing now, you want to use the scikit-learn implementation. But here's how you do it using uh, Alan Riddle's implementation of LDA. Um, the LDA package uh, Riddle created is confusingly called LDA, so it's almost impossible to Google. So right up there in the first line of this listing is the URL for it. Uh, so we're going to import LDA. We're also going to use a utility, essentially, from scikit-learn called account vectorizer, which is essentially going to take text and turn it into this bag of words representation. So the first thing I do here is I have some magic function that loads in my huge corpus of documents. That's nothing more than a list of strings. So I've got that, do that document list in. Then I'm going to instantiate this ob object I'm going to call a vectorizer. Um, which is going to, cons when applied, is going to either learn a vocabulary or take a string and turn it into this bag of words representation. So the first thing I do is learn a vo vocabulary with a transform step, and then I run the fit step to turn it into uh, a bag of words representation. This is how all scikit-learn um, objects work, generally. Um, and I'm going to compress that into one step here with uh, fit, dot, fit underscore transform, the documents. I'm also going to make a note of a bookkeeping object, which is this vocabulary. That's a list that is going to tell me how to convert from a location in this bag of words array to a human word, which I'm going to need later. Then I let LDA do its magic. I instantiate the LDA object, and then its API is rather similar to scikit-learns. There's a fit and a transform. So I'm going to run the fit, and that's going to take a few hours. So as you'll see in a second, the use case we had was summarizing Amazon product reviews, and I was running LDA on a couple of million Amazon product reviews. Um, on, the, on this exact laptop, that would take that took me two or three hours, I think. So this is a, you know not an insubstantial calculation, but you don't need GPUs for this. This is a manageable calculation to do. There's one constant in there. I set the number of topics arbitrarily to be 100. If anyone's got any questions or comments about that, we can talk about that at the end. But that's one place where LDA is, is a bit of an art as well as a science. You need to choose a number of topics that you think exist in your corpus, and it's a somewhat arbitrary choice. Um, Having made that choice, though, we now want to look at our results. Do they actually make sense? And here's just a couple of like, relatively trivial utility functions that allow you to examine an LDA topic model. Um, the important thing is, remember, a topic is a distribution over words. So what I want to do is extract out the words that have highest probability for each topic. The um, LDA model object has this thing, topic word underscore, which I mentioned at the top there, and that's an array. It has n topics rows, each row corresponds to a topic, and then it has the number, the number of words in the vocabulary columns. Each row is a probability distribution, which means each row, of course, adds up to one. And the biggest numbers in the row correspond to the words most relevant to that topic. So I'm going to go through each row and look for the words that have the highest probability. And there's a bunch of, you know, frankly, rather tedious NumPy there that you can use if you want. But to cut a long story short, you get results like this. These are the topics I found in a couple of million Amazon book reviews. So these are human written product reviews of books. And you can see, if you squint, these topics correspond to real meaningful topics. So the first one there is obviously food and recipes uh, and cookbooks. You've got the Harry Potter Wizards fantasy one there. If you look down, I would say number five is crime. Uh, number six is the bad man and the hero, Donald Trump's favorite kind of books. Um, number 11 there, you've got Twilight, essentially. That gets its own topic. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And the, you know, it's, it's quite funny looking through this list. But the point is, we've solved the first piece of our puzzle, which is getting from a corpus of documents to a topic distribution. Uh, the, the, that, those topics are the lens through which we are going to look at any future documents. Rather than bag of words, those documents, we are going to express them as a combination of topics. We're going to say this document is 50% politics, 30%, uh, what was it, computers, 20% genetics. And we can do that because we now know what those topics are. How do we do the second piece of the puzzle? That's super easy now we've fitted the model. You just need to run, tran you just need to run the LDA objects transform on a document. And this function will run it on multiple documents, and it will return to you a thing that has um, the number of documents as rows and as columns the topics. So for each row, we've got the weight of each topic. So again, each row will add up to one. 
uh, and you will have, you know, if, in a if your document is dominated by politics, the column corresponding to politics will be large for that, for that row. So that's implementing this piece of the puzzle, the bit where we look at a document using topics as the lens through which to examine them. So now we're in a position essentially to re-implement um, Loon's algorithm, but instead of looking for sentences that are dominated by words that are important, we're going to look for sentences that are dominated by topics that are important. And we're going to make things a little bit tougher by doing multi-document summarization here. So the use case is Amazon product reviews. If you look at a popular book on Amazon, it will have several thousand book reviews, five or 10,000 book reviews. And if those book reviews are, uh, let's say, 100 words long each, we're talking about half a million words, which is usually longer than the book itself. No one wants to read those. On the other hand, you might want something a bit richer than 3.8 stars out of five. There must be some middle ground. And that's what we're trying to find here with this summary. So the first thing we're going to do, and we've just done that, is train LDA on a corpus of product reviews. And we're going to choose a corpus that is all the book reviews. This is publicly available um, data if you go digging. Um, we're then going to choose the product whose reviews we want to summarize and simply concatenate all those product reviews. This is the simplest possible thing you could do. There's plenty of ways you could improve this step. But we're just going to concatenate all the reviews together into one big meta review. And then we're going to look at that meta review through the lens of these topics and learn which topics dominate reviews of this document. Uh, that's step two. Step three, then, is to do the same thing at the sentence level, to look at each sentence and see which, do which topics dominate each sentence. And we are then going to essentially score. We're going to look at each sentence and, sorry, we're going to look at each topic. And for each topic that is important to the meta review, so let's say the most important topic first, we're going to go looking for a few sentences that are at the sentence level are themselves dominated by that topic. And then we're going to go to the next topic and do the same thing. And we're going to do that for as many topics as we've got the patience for in terms of the length of our summary. And we're going to extract out as many sentences, again, as we think is appropriate for our, our user interface. And there's a ton of interesting user interface design questions about this kind of summarization. But here's the kind of results you get. I hope the uh, text is big enough to read there. Maybe if this works. No. Right. So this is a summary generated by this LDA topic model of an article uh, of a book by Guillermo del Toro. I didn't know he write book, writes books, but apparently he does with co-authors. And this is some sort of young adult uh, teen horror book. And this is one of the most uh, highest selling books on Amazon. I had no idea. But there are 5,000 reviews of this product. Here are 12 sentences that are, in some sense, a summary of the themes in the reviews. And rather than summarizing it by saying, people talk about the vampire romance topic, people talk about the as seen on TV topic, which is what I'm calling the first, the two topics on the left, we're going to extract real sentences that are a richer summary than saying something like that. This is a very, very practical technique. Latent Dirichlet allocation is a mature technology. It's 10 years or so old. It's in being improved in terms of like numerical stability and algorithmic details all the time. The scikit-learn algorithm is particularly good because it's online. And what that means is you can see new documents and update your idea of what a topic is as new documents come in. So your idea of what the politics topic is can evolve with time if, for example, some new person suddenly becomes relevant in, in politics over the last year or so. Um, so it's very practical, but it has a couple of problems. Um, one is that the topics don't come with names. I'm calling that first topic the Twilight topic or the Vampire Romance topic. I'm calling the second one the As Seen on TV topic. And those you probably agree with me. The third topic, that book, Martin, Time, Just Long, George, New, who knows what that topic is. The three sentences it's selected are all similar. But if you had to label that topic without seeing those sentences, you'd really struggle. Um, and that's a generic problem with this kind of problem. This is unsupervised machine learning. And unsupervised machine learning is great because you don't need to know the right answer. You essentially need half the training data. But you, st you do need to interpret the results of the model. That's problem one. But there is a more fundamental problem. You could ima imagine us like banging heads together and assigning names to these topics as a, you know, a product decision. But there's a more fundamental problem, which is a topic model reduces a string of text to the number of topics numbers. So in this case, we're going to take a string of text that's rich with human meaning and reduce it to 100 numbers. Clearly, that's lossy compression. And in fact, it's very lossy compression in many cases. So we want to deal with that. There's another problem, which is this idea of document order. 
As I mentioned, most of us have some intuition that sentences that appear early in a document are imp more important to its meaning, and that you know, is empirically true in most domains. Um, but there's also ideas like a document, an author might explore hypotheticals, contradict themselves, build up a rhetorical structure. And we'd love to be able to build a machine learning algorithm that incorporates those ideas. Those are very vague ideas. They're quite difficult to express in numbers. But I'm going to show you what is currently, in many ways, the state of the art of expressing those ideas in numbers, which is language embedding, which is an idea that's come out of neural networks. So I showed you Hans Peter Loon, and I show you David Bly. Neural networks are a, area of very active current research. Um, but um, so it's very difficult to attribute this work to one, one person. Um, but uh, this is Thomas Mikulov and Jamie Ryan Kiros. Both of those people have been intimately involved in work on language embedding. Thomas Mikulov in, is uh, best known for Word to Vec, perhaps, and Jamie Ryan Kiros for Skip Thoughts, which I'm going to talk about later. Language embedding is a way of when we take that step of vectorizing text, retaining as much meaning as possible. Rather than reducing it to 100 numbers, or rather than reducing it to a bag of words, we're going to do something much richer. We are going to lose some things in the process. We're going to lose interpretability in particular. But we are going to do a better job of the summarization task as a result. That's language embedding, which is going to help us solve this um, lossy compression problem. The other problem I mentioned is the document order. The idea that we throw away document order in both these algorithms I've shown you. We're going to solve that using recurrent neural networks. So let's talk about language embedding first. This is a cartoon of word to vec which you might have heard of. It was the, the new hotness in, uh, in 2013. Um, and it's a way, it's, it's a generic supervised machine learning task. Don't worry about neural networks for a second. The idea is, given some input, a word, can we predict the words that surround it? So here we've got one training example, the sentence, waffles are great. My input here is the word are, and can I predict that the words that surround it are waffles and great? With one training example, I'm going to struggle here. But imagine if I had a very, very large corpus of text, and my, my job is to predict this. The black box in this cartoon refers to generic machine learning algorithm. But in fact, the way this is done is with a neural network. So we do now need to take an excursion into neural networks and sort of get everyone on the same page about what these monstrosities are. So what we have here is this is a neural network. Um, and there are, with neural networks, some interesting connections with neuro neuroscience, but don't worry about those. These are just computational graphs. These are just a series of operations performed on input that yield output. And they are machine learning models, which means our goal is statistically give an input to get the right output, given some training data that shows us how to do that. In this case, we've got 10 input features. These are probably 10 real numbers. So let's say someone's location, someone's income, whatever. Um, we've got some hidden layers, which we'll come back to. And then there's the output. And the output, in this case, is the probability of membership of two classes. And these classes might be owns a car, does not own a car, votes Democrat, votes Republican, you know, lives in New York, lives in California, whatever. Um, if you know linear regression, this is not qualitatively different to what's going on in linear regression. We take the input. We multiply each number in the input by a number, its weight, and then we add them all together, and we come up with some prediction. Neural networks add in hidden layers in the middle that make, it a, make us able to go beyond the linear in linear regression to describe more complicated surfaces in higher dimensional space, if you want to think about it mathematically. Um, Fit, bo fitting both linear regression models and neural networks turns out to be numerically and algebraically rather tricky. Linear regression you can do, and most of us do these days, with scikit-learn rather than do it ourselves. Uh, that wasn't true a couple of years ago, or you know, maybe a bit more for neural networks. There was a lot of hand coding of GPU programming, of linear algebra, and heaven forbid, automatic differentiation. But those things have mostly been made unnecessary for non-specialists by the arrival of libraries like TensorFlow, which we heard about in this room this morning, or Keras. And I'm going to talk about Keras, which is, in a sense, a higher level, even, wrapper around TensorFlow, which abstracts away all those horrendous numerical details. Um, so what does all this have to do with word to vec with this idea of predicting the context of a word? So imagine instead of 10 input layer in inputs, we've got 30,000 inputs. This, again, is our vocabulary. And that input is going to be zero everywhere except at the element corresponding to the word R. 
And then we've got, again, 30,000 outputs. Those aren't going to be zero anywhere. Those are probabilities. And we want high probability to appear in words that are likely to proceed or follow the word R. So that probability, hopefully, is going to very, be very low for the word R, because R is unlikely to proceed or follow R in grammatical English. Um, but it's hopefully going to be high for waffles and great. Um, and we're going to feed through a ton of training data. The model's going to learn, uh, and away you go. Um, now, what's the significance of this? This predicting context thing it seems like a bit of a weird thing to want to do. It turns out predicting context itself is, itself is not what we're interested in here. We're interested in what's going on in the hidden layer. Because in the hidden layer of a word-to-vec model, the hidden layer is much smaller. Remember, we had this 30,000 input. The hidden layer here is a few hundred or a few thousand numbers. It's a vector of numbers, kind of like a topic model. It's a description of the semantics of the input. And we are going to rip that hidden layer out wholesale. And rather than do this prediction task it was born to do, we're going to use it for different downstream tasks. And you, you can do this right now in any of your natural language processing problems. Um, it turns out by ripping out this hidden layer, which by construction is good at predicting context, we are going to do a good job at doing other downstream tasks. What's an example of another downstream task involving the meaning of words, involving the meaning of language? This is word to vex most famous party trick. This is analogies. It turns out, remember I said these, these um, sequences of numbers are vectors. And a vector, of course, is a direction in space or a location in space. Imagine they're two-dimensional vectors, like in this, this cartoon here. What turns out to be true is that words that are semantically similar are close to each other in this space. And the route you take to go between two words, it has meaning as well. And what that means is the words Germany and France are close to each other. And the route I take to get from France to Paris is similar the route I to the route I take to get from China to Beijing. The this space has a semantic meaning. That's an extremely vague description of what's going on. And the specialists in this area don't, to be frank, do a lot better. This is a very theory poor area where no one really understands why this stuff works, but empirically it works very well. What we've got here is vectors that encode the meaning of words, and this is a huge deal. Just as another example of a bit of, of fun you can do. I didn't do this, but this is the, um, what's it, the uncanny, uncanny poetry machine of Dr. S, if you Google it. The URL is still an IP address, apparently. But what this does is it generates rhyming pairs for you know uh, particularly nerdy rappers, I guess. So what you do is you put in a word, and it gives you two words that are semantically similar to your seed word that also rhyme. So I put in the word fridge here, and it gave me examples like freezers, tweezers, and sorbet tray, which you can kind of see are semantically similar to fridge if you, if you squint. Um, how's it doing that semantic similarity? It's just looking for words that are close in word to vec space. word to vec space is similar to that two-dimensional space I showed you on the, on the previous page. So that's word to vec. We've now got a way of representing words that retains meaning. But when we're summarizing documents, we're not dealing with isolated works, words. We're dealing with higher order linguistic features like sentences. So we need something higher order. And this is word to vec with sentences. We've got an input sentence, C spot run. We're going to play a very similar game in, att in an attempt to predict the context of sentences that follow. There's some tricks you've got to play to make this work. The first trick is you've got to have a lot of training data. But even with that training data, the sentence, for example, C spot runs the new house is probably only going to occur once in your corpus, unless you've got a very unusual corpus. So we need to play tricks to deal with that fact that we've only got one example for every input. Um, but if you play those tricks, uh, then you come up with something called skip thoughts. Um, and skip thoughts was trained on you know, over 10,000 books, so a tremendous amount of words. Um, and in that way, we're able to, given a string of words, construct a vector that retains their meaning, just like with word to vec So remember, let's just take stock. Remember we said we had two problems with this topic model implementation. It throws away a lot of meaning by reducing text to 100 numbers or n topics numbers. Uh, and it also throws away word order. So I, I contest that we've solved the meaning problem here by reducing it to a larger number of numbers that does a better job for a per number of retaining meaning. But we also still need to deal with this idea of word order or sentence order or rhetorical structure. And that's where recurrent neural networks come in. Recurrent neural networks are pretty complicated things internally. But you can just assume they're these black boxes here. That we've got a three, level, a three input recurrent neural network here. What's going on is I've got one input. 
that input goes in at the top into a, into a neural network. Don't worry about its internal structure. Given that input, out comes a prediction. In the case of this summarization task, that input is going to be a sentence, and the prediction that's going to come out is a score, a score saying how good a summary it is. But that's not the only thing that's going to come out. Also going to come out is a vector, a vector that we're going to feed in alongside the second sentence into the next neural network. This is a recurrent neural network, a network that uses its own output alongside new input as input. And in that way, you can make machine learned predictions about things with temporal structure. It's an incredibly powerful idea. It solves also, by the way, one of the more mundane problems of machine learning. With machine learning, generally, your input needs to be the same size every time. So I talked about that machine learning model that predicts whether someone owns a car or not, and it uses their age, their income, whatever. I need to give that model the same 10 numbers every time. I can't leave numbers out. I can't add extra information. Um, if I'm doing image classification, I need my images to be 512 pixels by 512 pixels every time or whatever. Recurrent neural networks solve that because you can make these things arbitrarily long for each input. So that's the two pieces of the puzzle. We're not going to reduce things to 100 numbers with topic models. We're going to reduce things to what happens to be 4,800 numbers with skip thoughts. And we're also going to use this idea of recurrent neural networks. And I'm finally about to show you some code again if you were missing Python. So this is the outline of the algorithm we're going to use. This now is supervised machine learning. So LDA was not supervised machine learning. It was unsupervised machine learning. We learned these topics without any idea of what a summary looked like. With this approach, we do need model summaries. So we need article summary pairs. And because we're doing extractive summarization, we need summaries that use quotations from the original articles. That's important. And the way we found those is we got them from the website called thebrowser.com, which, again, is impossible to Google. So that's why the URL's up there. Um, and in that, that that's, a article, that's a website that aggregates long reads, like New Yorker-type articles, with handwritten summaries that are extracted from the original article. We took that data, um, and we turned it into training data. We, we vectorized each sentence in the training article using skip thoughts, and we assigned a score in e to each sentence in the training article by comparing it to the model summary and measuring its distance in jacquard space to the model summary. So that is, it's a little bit intricate to explain what, what's going on there, but really what we're doing is constructing a bag of words representation of every sentence in the model summary and the sentence we want to score. And we look at the distance of that sentence we want to score in jacquard space, which is a space of ones and zeros, to every sentence in the model summary and find the smallest distance. And we're going to call that the score of our sentence. So we've got our training data now turned into skip thoughts vectors, 4,800 numbers long, and real number scores. We're going to then train a recurrent neural network to map from input to output. And we're going to use a recurrent neural network so we can feed in these skip thoughts vectors one at a time and learn about rhetorical structure, learn about ideas like the first sentence being particularly important. We're then obviously going to use the model. We're going to use the model on, sentence, on articles for which we don't know the score, for which we don't have model summaries, and, l and predict the scores. And then we're going to play the usual game of extracting out the top few sentences, the top scoring few sentences. So some code. Now, I mentioned I'm going to use Keras rather than TensorFlow here. Keras is a high-level neural network library that I really like. It's a lot of fun to play with. It'll get you up and running really, really quickly without worrying about the details of linear algebra or GPU programming. Uh, and as long as you're doing something fairly vanilla, as long as you're not doing a PhD in neural networks, Keras is going to solve most of your problems. It's in some ways back-end agnostic. It's going to use TensorFlow or Theano for you to do the linear algebra, to do the tensor algebra. Um, so I'm importing TensorFlow. TensorFlow in many ways works a lot like scikit-learn. It instantiates models that have fit methods and transform methods, and we'll see those in a second. But the first thing I, de I do again is I've got my function that loads all the training data. And this time, I'm going to do a test train split because I'm doing supervised machine learning. And I've got scores as well as just documents. So I've got something a bit more than just a list of strings, which is what I had with LDA. I'm then going to run the text of the articles through skip thoughts. Skip thoughts is an already trained model. You don't need to do any training. You can download it from GitHub right now. And if you're an NLP person doing NLP tasks, I'd urge you to give it a go. Right now, where you're doing bag of words, Try using skip thoughts. It's, an, it's a method you can call on text, and it will give you a number. So it should be a drop-in replacement for your, whatever you're doing with bag of words. And you may find you get significantly better results. If you do, let me know. I'd be very interested to hear. 
But so that's skip thoughts, and now we want to use Keras. Keras is, like I say, like scikit-learn, but with scikit-learn, the models it uses, linear regression, things like that, are in general almost completely specified simply by saying the words linear regression. There aren't many things that you can tweak there beyond regularization parameters, things like that. But when I say neural networks, that's an almost infinite set of possible models. We now have to specify the structure of our model, and that's what those three, four lines that come after um, model equals model do. The first thing we do is we say we're going to add a layer of LSTMs. LSTMs are a variety of recurrent neural network. There are two you might hear about. LSTMs, which stands for long short-term memory, and uh, GRUs, which I can't remember what they stand for. Um, but those are the two ones. Um, and the number you'll recognize in that input is the magic number 4800. That's because you need to tell it how big the input is going to be. Not how many inputs there are going to be, how many sentences there are going to be, because that can vary. But you do need to tell it how long the skip thoughts representation is. In it goes. And then the next layer is the output. That's a, a thing called a time distributed dense, which is a thing that handles the output from a recurrent neural network. And that is only one number. That's the real number. That's the score. Um, there's one more thing I want to mention, which is these dropout arguments in the uh, LSTM layer. Dropout is, if you know machine learning, dropout is a form of regularization that prevents us from memorizing the training data. That's a particularly acute problem with neural networks because they're so powerful. With great power comes great responsibility with neural networks. You need to regularize fairly aggressively, um, or you need to be sure you do regularize. And the way you do that with neural networks is with a thing called, called dropout, which I'm happy to answer questions on. Um, and then this is supervised machine learning, so I'm going to fit uh, with a validation split so I can keep an eye on things and how things are going, because this is going to take several hours on a GPU, and I want to be sure I haven't totally screwed up 10 minutes in rather than coming back the next day. And then the next day, I'm going to run these last two lines, which are going to assess the overall accuracy and allow me to compare this to other approaches. Um, so like I say, this takes, uh, on our GPU machine, this took about six hours to run if you have a powerful GPU. If you don't have a powerful GPU, you can spend a, you know, a not insubstantial amount of money, to be completely frank, doing this on AWS. Um, cost of GPU programming on AWS is hopefully coming down. But if you're into this, you may find it easier to get your own uh, GPU machine. But that's the model. That's essentially the code we ran. And what did we do with it? We built a browser extension. Uh, and this is the browser extension. These are the results of the, of the model. You're on, uh, in this case, Ars Technica, or you could be on the New Yorker or whatever, reading a long article. In my browser, there's a little B button in the corner. And I can click that, and it will whir away for five or 10 seconds, scoring each sentence with respect to this model. And then it will choose which sentences are the most salient, the most representative. That's what it's been trained to do. It will try and do as similar a job as the editors of the browser.com did. That's its goal. And it does a pretty good job. This is actually not a very long article. So you know the summary is about half the length of the article. But you could say that that is a pretty good summary. What we've got here is, on the left, the extracted five sentences presented out of context. And in this case, you can just read those five sentences and get the gist of the article pretty well, apart from the fact that I've cut off the end sentence. Um, but also, because we're extracting things out of context, you can have problems there. You can extract out a sentence that uses a pronoun, like he. And if you pull it out, you may not know who he is. So we're, we also, as a user interface solution to that problem, present the article in context. And you can scroll through the article, letting your eyes glaze over the bits that aren't highlighted. And we make that even easier in a way that would probably horrify the author of the article by blurring out low-scoring sentences, which is another interesting user interface approach that I, you know, to be honest, probably don't recommend, but it's a bit fun. Um, so that was a one-minute article. It's, you know, you've probably had a minute to read that in the time I've been listening to it. But a longer article, this one is eight minutes, according to Instapaper, whose API we use that to extract out the text of the articles. This is a much longer article. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about Google um, beating a human at, at the game Go. Um, and uh, you know, you'll have to take my word for it, because you haven't got eight minutes to read the article. But this on the left here is a pretty good summary of the article, a pretty good extractive summary of the article. We did, in, in most cases, the most obvious steps possible in each one of these algorithms, the LDA one and the neural network model. There's refinement that could be done. Uh, and if we were going to publish them academically, we would do that. Um, but I'm going to stop here and compare them to each other. Um, we talked about three approaches. Remember, the Loon's method, the stupid, simple heuristic method, the heuristic being words mentioned often are important, and sentences that mention those words are representative. We played a very similar game with LDA, but with topics rather than words. And then we went 
um, full neural network, and you skip thoughts and recurrent neural networks. So let's comp I've got four axes, if you like, to compare them on. The first one is training data. So a heuristic, by definition, does not require training data. You simply claim it's true, and away you go. Uh, so that requires zero training data, which is why heuristics are down at the bottom there on, on the training data axis. Recurrent neural networks require a ton of training data. And in particular, they require model summaries. They need examples of what good summaries look like. Topic modeling and LDA in particular is somewhere in the middle. You do need a fairly large corpus of representative documents, documents that are similar to the ones you want to summarize, but you don't need model summaries. It's unsupervised learning. So I put LDA in the middle there. Then I've got domain expertise. By domain expertise, I don't mean are you a good Python programmer. I mean, do you understand the documents? Do you, do you know what a good summary looks like? And that's the advantage of supervised machine learning. You don't need to know. This, it's the computer's job to figure out what a good uh, summary looks like or how you make a good summary. And that's why recurrent neural networks are on the left there. Obviously, neural networks are relatively hard technology. But like I say, domain expertise in terms of the documents. LDA is somewhere in the middle because, like I said, choosing the number of topics, looking at the topics to see whether they make sense, naming the topics, perhaps, if you need to do that for your user interface, does require you to understand the documents to an extent. And then heuristics, I think, are the mo require the most domain expertise of, of all. You need, to understand, you need to be able to invent heuristics that might work, and you need to be able to assess whether they have worked, and that's perhaps the most demanding of all. On the next set of axes, we've got computational cost. Of course, recurrent neural networks are the highest. Heuristics essentially zero. Like I said, go away and don't have coffee in the coffee break. Implement Loon's algorithm, and you'll see that's in an instantaneous calculation, essentially. LDA is somewhere in the middle in terms of computational cost. With interpretability, that's the one outlier here. RNNs are completely uninterpretable. Skip thoughts, vectors, if you look at them, they make absolutely no sense whatsoever. They magically work. No one really knows why, but they don't tell you anything more about the text. Heuristics, they're interpretable in the sense that you could do those calculations by hand without too much time. I mean, depending on how long the document is. Um, which means that you can look at its answers, look at which sentences identify, and say why they've identified that sentence. That's my definition of interpretability. Can you figure out why it's made the decision it has? And you can do that for heuristics, and you can't do that for RNNs. You can do that for LDA as well, but LDA I've put even far, a little bit further over to the right, because LDA, in my view, comes with some extra interpretability. It comes with this idea of topics. It comes with this statement that all those reviews of that Guillermo del Toro book, I've got the representative sentences, but I've also got a statement that they are dominated by the vampire romance topic, which is additional information that may not have been obvious to me. The reason it's obvious to the computer is that the computer has read two million other reviews. It is able to place that document in context and provide extra information that you might not, as a human even, be able to extract just by looking at the document in isolation. But I think it's fair to say that RNNs are the, are the best performing in terms of quality of summary. And I want to connect this to other, the more general topic of language modeling in the last couple of minutes. There's all sorts of things you could do with RNNs. And it says LSTM here, but just assume that means RNN. You can take input and output. And if your problem involves dealing with language, and language, of course, has rhetorical structure. Order has meaning. Being able to retain semantic meaning is important. Both of those come out of recurrent neural networks. Then you can solve those kinds of problems. We've got, for example, you can feed images in and generate readable captions. People do this right now. You can feed in, you know, the classical example is machine translation, going from English to Russian or English to, to Spanish or whatever. I guess that would be useful in this room. Uh, and then you've got uh, audio transcription. Audio transcription, of course, is a task that requires understanding of language. We could all um, sit around and try and transcribe a recording of a language we don't speak. And we, you know, we'd write down like sounds, phonetic idea of what they're saying. But someone who speaks that language is going to do a, a better job. And in some sense, these LSTMs speak the language. And I haven't included this here, but you can do all sorts of things with unstructured text information. So imagine feeding in the AP wire of news stories and feeding out trading decisions. You could do that. You'd probably destroy the world economy if you did. But people are trying to do it right now. Um, so that's why I'm excited about recurrent neural networks and skip thoughts for um, uh, for machine learning. Um, I promised you, that was a very conceptual talk, there was not a lot of Python, but I promised you, just at the end, some further reading if you're interested. Uh, uh, so if you want these URLs, you can just go to my, my talk. Um, but just to say why I put the, each of these ones on the reading list, because this is quite a lot of reading, 
If you're interested in topic modeling, the best place to start, Tim Hopper gave a talk at Pi Data 2015 last year, which introduces the idea much more thoroughly than I did, much more clearly with Python code to make these probabilistic ideas concrete. Can't recommend it highly enough. If you prefer to read um, an article, then David Bly, the author of LDA, don't read the, I mean, by all means read the original paper, but perhaps a better place to start, he wrote a review article um, as a solo author in 2012 that I think makes it particularly clear. Um, there are equations in there, it's a meaty article, um, but it's a, it's a holistic overview of what's going on. Neural networks obviously is a colossal topic, um, and if you Google deep learning, you'll get a, a tremendous amount of bullshit. Um, but here's, a, here's six places I think are a good place to start. As good a place as any is Jan LeCun and co-authors' deep learning review that was in Nature last year. Jan LeCun is the guy in charge of deep learning and AI at Facebook. Uh, he's one of the 900-pound uh, the, the, uh, gorillas of this discipline. That review is, is a very good article that gives you um, an overview of what's going on. Andrew Ng's Coursera course on machine learning, the middle couple of lectures of it are about um, neural networks. It's a great series of lectures on machine learning generally if you're interested. It's not Python. Unfortunately, you've got to use MATLAB. Um, but... Uh, the middle couple of lectures on, on neural networks are fantastic, I think. Alternatively, again, if you prefer to read rather than watch, uh, Michael Nielsen's free textbook on deep learning, first three chapters of that are an extremely clear introduction to the mathematics of what's going on when a neural network is being trained without getting into horrifying technical details. It's very, very accessible. For Keras, for how to code in Keras, the documentation for Keras is excellent. The documentation for TensorFlow is also excellent. Uh, the talk to this morning about TensorFlow was also excellent. If you want to take the Keras approach, which is, I think is perhaps a slightly gentler introduction, then I wrote a, um, a Jupyter notebook and recorded a video for O'Reilly explaining how to get started by analogy to scikit-learn, and that's a, maybe a good place to start. The video is not free, unfortunately, um, but the Jupyter notebook is, so if you go to that link, you can, uh, you can take your pick. Um, Chris Ola wrote a bunch of articles giving intuition on what's going on with a training of a neural network, in particular with recurrent neural networks. The article, Chris Ola's article on recurrent neural networks is what cracked the nut for me and what made it make sense. And then finally, if you're getting deep into this, um, Joab Goldberg's article on natural language processing with neural networks is fantastic. It's about 30 pages long. It's, it's a little bit technical, but it's, I think, very, very clear, very, very highly recommended. Um, and if you, did, if you missed anything in my talk, go to the slides and hit P on your keyboard, and you'll get all the stuff I forgot to say um, as my presenter notes. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, are we, we're out of time for questions, are we? Or what's? Uh, we've got three minutes. Three minutes for questions. Questions, yeah. How do you validate the boundary It's a, you squint. It's a big problem. Um, we, by definition, I mean, you saw with my test train split and my cross-validation for the recurrent neural network model, we are formally validating in the formal sense. And our target is summaries like the browser.com. So we've, inherent in our project is that those are good summaries, which they may not be for your purposes. Um, for an unsupervised approach like LDA, you basically can't. LDA is a very, it, it's a very, it's a black art validating what's going on with LDA. Um, Empirically, it seems to work pretty well. Um, you can see the failure modes when things have gone wrong with LDA. For example, the way I like to do it is set the number of topics to far too small or far too high. And you see two, two different kind of failure modes, and they jump out quite clearly. But in terms of formal validation, it's a complicated enough species of unsupervised machine learning that that's not really possible. David Bly has some stuff to say about that in the review article I mentioned. It's an area of active current research. Yep. Uh, thank you, first of all, and foremost, for that amazing talk. Um, so I noticed, uh, and it was also surprising, um, I noticed that, uh, like, uh, what was missing from this, um, not in a bad way, uh, it was, like, f from the Wikipedia article, they talk about text rank and lex rank. So I'm wondering if you could compare the topics that you talk about versus that and, like, uh, yeah. how effect. Yeah. I mean, my view of those, I would, uh, this is going to sound patronizing, but those classical summarization algorithms, is that they are a very sophisticated members of the class of heuristics. Um, and they suffer from the same problems. They require domain-specific expertise to validate, um, you know, notwithstanding you know, the approaches I've described as problems with validation. Um, they're also very fragile against changes in language. 
So if people start using different ways of describing things, or if you want to apply this technique that you, depends on documents being written a certain way in Chinese, then they don't help. Yeah. One more over there? No. Nope. Nope. I'll catch you later. <laughs>